Welcome to Off Screen. This week we're reading Get Out by Jordan Peele. A young African American man visits his Caucasian girlfriend's cursed family estate. Jordan Peele is most famous for... Being one half of Key and Peele. Right. Pretty great comedy duo. They have a show on Comedy Central. It looks um, it looks good from what I've yeah. seen. And then we recently saw their movie, or the movie that they co-wrote. Oh, yeah. Um, called Keanu. Which we saw primarily because it st- stars a kitten. A really adorable kitten. Well, no, I wanted to see it because of them, because I like the show. I saw it for the kitten. That's right. Which wasn't in the movie enough. I was a little disappointed. Oh, actually, shoot. I should say that they... Jordan Peele co-wrote it with uh, Alex Rubens, but they both co-starred in it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it seems seems like Jordan Peele, the one who wrote the script we're reading today, is more of the writer. I mean, I think think he also does, obviously, write for the show and stuff, but... As far as, like, feature-length screenplays. Yeah, like I saw, I guess Jordan Peele is going to be working on some new... Tracy Morgan project, helping to write that mm-hmm. as well. Um, but I guess they both. Sorry, I'm stepping on. This is usually your no, no, section, you got but it. you got it. Take it away. It looks like they got their start on Mad TV, or at least Jordan Peele did. I can't speak to to Key, but sure. Um, yeah, in the early 2000s with Mad TV, and he's written for a bunch of other random shows before they got their own show. Yeah, um, and then this is kind of a horror. Yeah, script. Which and when he's we he's gonna write and direct it. Which I don't oh, know really? how much. Uh, he doesn't look like he's directed much else before. If anything, actually, no. This will be his directorial I mean, debut. Yeah, I think it's safe to say they probably directed some of the skits in Key and Peele. Yeah, but yeah, though not first feature film. Before, That's a big deal, and it's uh-huh. pretty surprising that this is. I mean, it's got funny moments in it, but it is pretty much just a horror movie. It is. Yeah, it's not too surprising. I mean, I feel like. They've done pretty thoughtful sketches, like, related to race and all that, and that's kind of what this is about, too, despite right. being in the horror genre. True, true. Um, so it's not too far removed from their show, or even Keanu, though Keanu was much more of an absurd comedy. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Should I go ahead and yeah. get into the summary here? Okay. A Brooklyn-based photographer named Chris heads upstate for the weekend with his girlfriend Rose to meet her parents. They're a very wealthy, very white family. Chris is worried at first because Rose has never had a black boyfriend before, but when he meets them, her parents are extremely warm and welcoming. Rose's mother even offers her services as a hypnotherapist to help Chris quit smoking. He wakes up the next morning and still isn't sure if it really happened or not. Shaking it off, Chris prepares for the party Rose's family is hosting that night for all their friends. Besides a guy named Logan, he's the only black person in attendance. And the way Logan acts, he might as well be white. That is, until a camera flash seems to snap him out of it. Momentarily himself again, Logan tells Chris to get out before it's too late. But just as Chris is putting the pieces together, Rose's mother appears to hypnotize him again. This time, Chris wakes up tied to a chair in an operating room, where it's explained that Rose's father, a neurosurgeon, has developed the first successful brain transplant procedure. All those friends at the party were actually bidding on Chris's body. As it happens, black people are in style at the moment. Chris barely escapes with his life by burning the house to the ground and killing everyone inside. But even when the cops arrive on the scene, they only arrest Chris for the murders. Still partially hypnotized, he can't remember enough to exonerate himself. He's just happy to have put an end to it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so Rose's family is like kind of part of a secret society kind of. Yeah. Seeking immortality. Sort of a they, cult, I guess. Yeah. They talk about praising, like, the sun god or something. Yeah, so they're into some weird shit. Yeah. Well, I guess, no, they're into, like, um... Yeah, it's weird. Like the, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> like, the fountain of life type stuff, like, finding yeah. something that will grant Im- I mean, they gave... They, they offered only a very cursory explanation. Yeah. Um, which bothered me a little bit, because I, I still don't really get it, like... Yeah, was it an immortality thing, like, where... They transplant their brain into a younger person so they can just keep living on and on. Sort of like the uh, being John Malkovich thing. That's what it seemed like. Yeah. 
that's a nice connection to our Charlie Kaufman script right. from last week, actually. Totally intentional. Uh, yeah, sure it was. Um, but anyway, should we should we start with what we liked about it? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I I just glossed over the ending a little bit, but I did I did like it, even though it was kind of a messed up, kind of abrupt ending. He basically just like kills everyone. He burns well, the to house be fair, down. He kills them because they are trying to take out his brain. Yeah, I'm not saying it was yeah. wrong. I'm just saying right. he kills right. them all. Yeah. And then he escapes. And then, yeah, the police end up arresting him, which is also sort of a commentary, I think, uh, about race. Well, kind of like the commentary inherent in, it's not a smash cut, or they don't use those words, but it essentially uh-huh. is, from the police showing up to... Uh, him in prison? To him in prison. It's as if, like, it's implying as if, like, what else could have right. happened in that situation. Right. It's like the word of a rich white guy against um, his word. Yeah. So that was, it was, like, effective in that respect. Also, there was a really nice touch in one part, which I'll have to do a little explaining here. Mm -hmm. But there is a little bit of backstory that Chris tells his girlfriend Rose earlier on in the script where he feels very guilty about his mom's death because she was in a car accident, but she wasn't killed immediately. And Chris, at the time, was just, like, at home watching TV. And he was actually, like, wondering, oh, where is she? I hope she's okay. She's never late. Yeah, and if he had actually, like, done anything about it, he might have been able to save her in time. But he just sat watching TV. So he felt very guilty about that. You see him when he's under hypnosis, he kind of has a flashback to that. And he's sitting, like, on his bed, sort of, like, nervously um, scraping at the arm of, like, the chair. or Or the, I guess it's the bed frame in this case. I think he was in bed. I forget. But... In any case, when he's tied to the chair in the operating room, he does a similar thing where he kind of rips up the arm of the chair and then uses, like, the stuffing inside of the cushioning of the chair. This is very, like, roundabout, I realize. But, yeah, he, like, stuffs that into his ears so that he can't hear the hypnosis, like, the trigger the cue, yeah. thing that they've, yeah, hypnotized him to hear. Um, so that that was kind of nice. Like he doesn't really overcome his his feelings of guilt about his mom's death, but he at least is able to use that in a way that ends up saving him. Right. So that was nice. So that's good. Yeah, that yeah. was good. Um, there was I guess some decent foreshadowing when Rose and uh, Chris first come to the estate, and they're introduced to Walter, who's like takes care of the grounds. Right. He's kind of their servant. Also, they call him a servant, which is like it's like yeah. a very you don't say that in 2016 <laughs> um and that's kind of there's a lot of little signals that things are, right. are off not just how like the weird look that uh georgina the she's like the other house she's like a housemaid yeah and these are both black by the way yeah. that georgina and walter are both black and they are basically servants yeah yeah um but no but later on i guess what my point was was that uh one of them say, oh, yeah, we brought them on uh, to help take care of Grandma and Grandpa, like, as they were getting oh, old. Oh, I forgot about that. And it's kind of nice, it's kind of good foreshadowing in the sense that we later come to find out that they actually are Grandpa The same procedure grandma. that was about to be done to Chris had been done to right. the real Walter, the real, real Georgina. Yeah. Although, that's another thing, I that was still a question I had at the end. Okay, so, fine, those are Rose's grandparents. Now they're, like, just basically zombies because they had their brains m- messed up or whatever. But, like, that's the thing. Was it a transplant? Was it, like, an unsuccessful transplant or what? Cause no, they, they seemed... were just put on it. They act, were... I think. What? No, there's no way. Because, like, there was a part where early on when they're having a tour of the house, yeah. they walk in on Georgina and she's just, like, staring at the wall. And as soon as soon soon as as soon as they enter the room, she, like, comes to life and acts normal again. Which I took right, to mean... Right, because she doesn't normally do the cleaning, so she wouldn't be cleaning... I thought it was because she was, like, hypnotized, and she doesn't actually do anything unless they, like, command her. No, I don't think so. I don't know, it wasn't the Why would she be got. staring at the wall? She was just in there, like, eavesdropping. No way. They made that well, sound funny. so suspicious. Yeah, it just says, um, Dean and Chris continue their walkthrough. They're taking, like, a tour of the house. The kitchen is large, homey, and pristine. Large windows overlook the backyard. Georgina, African-American, weird, yeah. 30, stands facing a wall. She is still. 
And then it says, upon hearing them, Georgina comes alive. She resumes cleaning the kitchen. No, you're right. It's weird. But I don't understand why it would be an unsuccessful transplant. That doesn't make sense. Or at least, like, that was just a failed, like, attempt on their way to figuring out how to do these transplants. I don't know. They, cause they I don't seem, know, because Walter they're, like, seems in a trance. perfectly proficient at the end, by the end. Yeah, by the end. But, like, he had to... I think it's just more the fact that Chris is sensing that something's amiss with them. Like, they aren't acting like normal people, people that he would... But you don't think they're in, like, a trance or something? That wasn't the impression I got. There's no way, no. I don't, or by the end, I, I just don't understand how that dis- makes sense. But also, because there's a part at the end... Okay, so Chris learns that if you use a camera flash, like he did on that guy at the party, yeah. they snap out of it for a minute. So he does that to Walter at one point, and he suddenly snaps out of it and realizes what he's doing. He was, like, about to kill Chris... So he flashes the picture really quick to save himself. And so when Walter snaps out of it, he suddenly shoots Jeremy, the son, in the family because he was also trying to kill Chris. So it's like definitely a hypnotized thing. Okay, so... Right? Walter and Georgina, the... And the the flash just deactivates the procedure. Or it just like... It allows like their... It it pauses the hypnosis for a minute. Sure, okay. That was my understanding. Anyway. Yeah, I guess it's not too important. I don't know. I mean, that was an important part of the plot. It was a pretty central thing. But, like, thing. if they're just hypnotized, it's still, like... The hypnosis the... is just... Uh, let me explain to you how brain transplants work, Stephen. Okay. It's very sorry, simple. Sorry, sorry. I, I skipped that lecture. hypnotize the person, and then you explain... Because they did this, and I thought this was <laughs> at least a somewhat logical explanation for <laughs> why. Because a lot of scripts, it seems like there's that scene where the bad guy tells you his whole plan... Yeah. And there's a thing like that here, but they kind of explain it in a way that, like, look, we have to have you understand what we're doing to your brain. That helps, yeah, that actually helps your brain assimilate the, like, once we do the transplant. Um, that, that was nice. I thought it kind of worked for me. But anyway, you have to hypnotize them first, yeah, to help, like, prepare their mind to absorb this new okay. person. That was my understanding. But they're still functionally the grandparents, right? I don't think so. Then what's the point? Like they that they made a they they had they exhibited when Chris wasn't present. Oh they exhibited, my gosh! Wait, I totally forgot that that Walter and Georgina are black and they're white. So like obviously there was a brain transplant as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I completely see. I don't see race. That's the problem. <laughs> also, I also don't read. Yeah. I also don't read race on the page. Well, you gotta. Anyway, okay, yeah, I see. So, so basically, they were they were putting on an act, right? Kind of, or there was like some weird. They, I guess, because right cognitive dissonance, which is probably like only the least of it concerning. Right, because it's the person whose body it is who's really in a trance. So the like the the black people, whoever they originally were. Right, actually, they were previous boyfriends of Rose. Right, so yeah, they did explain that as well. Well, I guess. Chris finds a bunch Walter of was. Yeah, yeah. Chris Chris finds a bunch of pictures of Rose with other black dudes and is like, "Wait a minute, she told me I was the first. She went out of her way to say that, yeah. Um that was one of a handful of like genuinely unnerving moments, I thought. That was a pretty good one, yeah. Um cuz it cuz it comes across organically to the story, like he just yeah. kind of stumbles upon it but not well, in a contrived way. Well, cuz by then he's like already packing his stuff. He's like I got to get out of yeah, here. Yeah, he, so he, he kind of knows what's going that, on. Like something weird is happening. And that, he doesn't know that Rose is complicit in it. Right. And that that part where he finds the photos is also kind of lumped in together with another really great moment that I wish they could have like separated them a little bit, distributed them a little more evenly, but mm-hmm. that's right around the same time that his friend back home in like Brooklyn calls him cuz Chris had sent him the picture of that guy Logan who he thought he recognized and it turns out it was their their friend from back in the day who like went missing years ago and now he's this whole completely other person and that's like you know one of Chris's first clues as to what's going on but yeah. that was a really cool reveal too and that happened like right about the same time as the photos and I that was kind of a bummer cuz those were both good moments and they deserved to breathe a little more I thought sure i think that's a valid point um another moment i liked is when uh he goes to the bathroom and kind of we pull back and we reveal that like all of the conversations that have been going on are kind of just phony bullshit and really like he's the center of the party and right. the party only exists so that they can like judge him and look right. at him and like he's on display the entire time right 
Uh, I like that in concept, but that moment didn't work for me. Oh, really? Like, it's it actually does say... Let me find this, because I had it. On page 55, as soon as Chris leaves to go to the bathroom, it says, It is now clear that their conversations have been fake. They are all hanging on Chris's actions. I just don't know how that would play. Like, are they just suddenly standing still and silent when he leaves? Because, like, these are still real people. Like, wouldn't they continue talking anyway? Yeah, um, but I think maybe, I think there's a way to demonstrate, like, kind of the shift in energy, like, everyone's having a conversation, but they're really, like, looking at him, you yeah. know, and, like, it, like if all the eyes and, like, all the voices follow him as he leaves the room. That would be good, that good would if be, it was kind of subtle and just eerie. I kind of feel like that's, it wasn't perfectly written, but it, I, feel I think like it that's was the like, yeah, effect I think was, they're going for. I think it was just overwritten, like, yeah. the fact that it actually explains it is now clear that their conversations have been fake. Sure. It shouldn't actually tell us that. It should just be like, as soon as he leaves the room, everyone turns and watches him for a moment, or, you know, yeah. they kind of pause their conversation or whatever, and let us understand it ourselves. That would have been better. Um, and this this either happens, like, right after or right before. Um, I guess probably right before. But, no, Chris has a conversation with Rod, his friend, who's watching his dog. Yeah. Um, and Rod's, like, kind of... He's making, like, joking type of things about, like, how right. weird it is. Like, he's the one black guy here right. among, like, I don't know, 50 old white people and right. one Asian, old Asian guy. Um, and he says something to the effect of, yeah, you feel like you're on display, right? Yeah. Um, and that's reinforced kind of in a more uh, grounded way in how, like, Every conversation that he has with these people, they're, like, bringing his race. Like, the only thing they ask him right. is about his race. Or, like, one of the wives, one of the trophy wives, asks Rose, oh, is the sex better with a black guy? Is that true? Right, right. Um, That's cool. I, I didn't think back on that, but that all does make sense once you know what's actually going sure. on. That's But cool. it also probably isn't... I mean, I mean, obviously, like, we're both white, so I don't know. But, like, the, the, the sense that, like, if you are kind of like othered in a situation mm -hmm. and then people everyone is like asking you about like your race as if like yeah. to either to prove that they're totally cool with it which is awkward or like like one guy says oh yeah i know tiger woods as if that means right. anything to chris yeah and chris doesn't play sports at all you know he's right. he's totally disinterested in golf he's played played it once they say but like that's how they interact with him and it's a really it's kind of it's really like a a weird sort of estrangement, I guess. Yeah. Probably experienced by Chris. Also, you see that um, when Jeremy, the brother, asks, like, he keeps trying to get uh, Chris to, like, perform, like, some sort of sport or physical activity. Right. Like, first, asks him if he's into MMA. Second, like, uh, lacrosse and right. uh, badminton, so on and so forth. Um, Jeremy, by the way? Huge dish. Well, yeah, he's he's Rose's brother, yeah. and he's there, I guess, for the same reason as everyone else, or he's just there for the so-called party, but uh, he would not die. He he seemed like he died multiple times <laughs> when Chris was making his getaway. Like, I'm pretty sure, yeah, Chris stabs his eye with a key, stabs him in the eye, and he's still alive. Yeah, first, well, the first and, time makes sense. He would beat him with a badminton racket. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's not going to finish the yeah. job for sure. <laughs> yeah. But then he comes back again, stabs him in the eye with a key, then he comes back again. That's the moment I was talking about where Chris uses the flash camera on Walter, and then Walter wakes up for a moment and shoots Jeremy, and then he still comes back again one mm -hmm. more time. And I forget how he actually finally dies. I don't even know. Yeah. Well, does he die? It says... Jeremy's still alive. Blood pours from his mouth. They both go for the gun, grabbing at the same time. He bludgeons Jeremy over and over with the bed of the gun into the ground. Chris is lost in violence. Two right. police cars pull up. He drops I, the gun. I guess I thought in that moment where it says he hits him over and over with the butt of the gun that he died in that moment. But, oh, I mean, it's. I guess it's just not specified. Yeah. But if none of that other stuff killed him, maybe that didn't either. I don't know. Um, He seems pretty... He is into MMA, and he's a very athletic dude, so... Yeah. There were a lot of things in this that reminded me of Meet the Parents. Oh, okay. The original one. I don't know if you remember it that Wait, well. I don't know if you're saying this is a criticism, though. A little bit. Because the first Meet the Parents was really good. It was good, if you like that kind of cringe comedy, which uh, I can. Uh, I can, to an extent. Okay. In small doses. 
uh, and Ben Stiller is is very good. De Niro and De Niro, every yeah, whatever. Meet the Parents is a fine movie. Okay, I'm just saying this ripped it off. I think in in several ways. I mean, obviously just the premise, but it's it was also true that in ben, uh, Meet the Parents, Ben Stiller was trying to quit smoking, and right. And her parents sort of disapproved, and so he felt insecure about it and was trying to quit. Mm-hmm. That reminded me of that. Um, but just, I think, I guess just a lot of the setup. The girl is a doctor in both, um, and I don't know. It's just very cliche in a lot of ways, I guess. Both movies, yeah. Meet the Parents and this. Um, there are but a lot I of... feel like it, they're almost going for that archetype, too. Like, to make it so ordinary. Yeah, I guess. Like, uh, like it shouldn't, you know, like, that's a cringe comedy, but, like, it's, it's such a typical experience that, like, every couple has, eventually, or yeah, almost every couple yeah. has, but then for it to be immediately unnerving or filled with anxiety because he's black and she's white, right. and then for it to evolve into horror, it's kind of, it's, in its way, like, uh... Yeah, yeah, it, it's, I guess, enough of a twist with all of the crazy horror stuff that it doesn't need to be any more different in other ways, but yeah. but I was just worried because it seemed like it. Chris was, was too generic. He didn't really have much personality. There were a lot of lines where he's just, like, very agreeable every time that they're talking to him. He just yeah. has all these really bland lines, and he doesn't really want anything that much. Like, he's kind of nervous to meet the parents, but then as soon as we get to the mansion, they're very nice to him, and, like, clearly that isn't going to be much of an obstacle, and so, and I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite for criticizing this, Mm because I've been having trouble with this in my own writing, and I think it's hugely important, but he, like, his character just doesn't have much of a want, like, for most of the script. Like, it's more just... Doesn't he just want to meet the parents? Is that not enough? Well, then the movie would be over by, like, page 30. Anyway... My point is just that, yeah, he's kind of slowly unraveling things, but it's not a lot to really, like, keep me engaged for a lot of the, like, first half of the script. Um, it didn't seem like it was it was going anywhere very very fast. Like, yeah. it's, it's fine if you want to have a crazy twist like that where they're trying to, like, do a brain tra- transplant and hypnotize him and all of that stuff is great, and that's very entertaining once all of that comes to light. But before that... I didn't really know what I was supposed to be rooting for or expecting to happen, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, I was going to say about the uh, the sort of twist ending, which I use the word twist hesitantly. I mean, it was pretty clear pretty early on what was going on. But again, that's that's what I, that's kind of my point. Uh, I feel like we've read a few scripts with mm-hmm. what you could call a twist ending where it's like, a twist on top of a twist almost because in this case you know that the mom is a hypnotherapist early on she does the the weird thing to kind of put him in a trance pretty early in the script Mm -hmm. and you think okay there's yeah something something creepy is going on about her hypnotizing people which is true yeah and then on top of that once you learn that then there's the whole brain transplant thing and it's like a twist on top of a twist or it's just like adding it's just more icing on the top the, yeah, and they kind of tip their hand up maybe a little bit too That's early. That's why I think the, the brain transplant thing is stuck in there on top of everything else. I feel like yeah. they felt like they were... they had it's And I don't like this. I don't agree with this. I feel like it's trying to satisfy the people who are too dumb to miss all of the hints about the hypnotism stuff or not, sure. not see where that's going. And they're trying to still surprise people that were onto it from the jump and like, oh, well, you didn't expect this. Brain transplants. Right. And, like, there's no way you could ever predict that. So that's no. not that satisfying to hear when that when that comes out. It's just yeah. crazy. Um, well, even when she's doing the the hypnosis on him, like, she's at first very empathetic. But then, like, there's a line that says her, like, empathetic look turns to, like, a creepy, sinister look. Right. And that kind of – that's unnecessary, I think. Yeah. That just – that tips you – off to the fact that there's more going on here, and it makes right. everything else like kind of less surprising, because it would have been totally nor it would have been totally feasible for her to just be kind of like overcompensating and like overly friendly, like, oh, you want to quit right. smoking? Let me help you, like forcing herself upon, forcing right. her help upon him. Well, um, as if to like prove something. Yeah, I think um, looking back at uh, what was the script called, Eli. 
that we read? Eli, yeah. The one about the uh, kid who turns out to be possessed yeah. by the devil. That was a great twist ending. Again, I, I know we disagree about that yeah. one. I thought it was brilliant. But I think it, either way, we can learn from that. I think that worked well, for me at least, because even if you have a twist, which you want to try and foreshadow a little bit, I think the better way to do it is by sort of using a red herring, you know, like throw another suspicion in there for the audience to buy into. Like, oh, they think, in, in this the case of Eli, they think this kid is in this safe house because he has some kind of autoimmune disorder and he can't be outside because the germs will, like, kill him. Yeah. When really he's trapped there because he's possessed and they're trying to, like, exercise the steam in from him. So, whatever. But my point is, there was no other thing for the in this script for us to believe was going on. You know what I mean? There was no decoy explanation. It was pretty much all just, like, well, hints I think at what was because, actually happening. I think only because they reveal kind of the sinister intentions of... Rose's family too early. Yeah. I think had they played that down and just kept them as like over the top, overcompensating, like trying to prove yeah. that they're not racist. Right, you know? right. Trying to prove how helpful and chill they are. Yeah. Then I think that would have worked. But they give up that too quickly. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um Thought it was a little convenient that uh when Chris wakes up and he's in the operating room and they're about to like cut his skull open, basically he's in like a separate room from the other dude who's receiving the brain. And so like that helps him get away in a way because he like manages to kill. I think he kills Rose first. It allows him to face the people in succession. Right. It's it's like like the problem with, with action movies where it's like, there's a crowd of guys all fighting our hero, but they only go one at a time. So it's like, easy on him yeah like exactly. that sort of thing no, just but it's like him. <laughs> it seems to me like if you're doing a brain transplant step one is get both people in the same room like right, how, yeah. how are these people in different parts of this for sure building um i don't know yeah do you have anything else i uh, not really that was pretty much all i wanted to say cool should i say should i start talking about how we have a website well here we go or you can email us at info at ospodcast.com. We're on iTunes, mm-hmm. off-screen podcast. Um, if you wrote us a review, that would be much appreciated. Yeah. We're on Stitcher. Um, but also, we're, we're open to requests if you have scripts that you want us to read. And mm-hmm. I, I was going to ask you, are, are we you, reading that let's one? Do it, yeah. Okay, cool. We had a request from someone named Andrew who wanted us to read the script Mina. Mina? Is that how you say it? Mena? Mina? I don't know. Mena? Min- Min- Minya. I don't know. <laughs> let me let me see if I can find a log line for this. Did we do we have anything else we want to say? Um, I don't think. Oh, we need to do verdicts at some point. Oh, of course. Yeah, verdicts. You, you right. Take us off. Uh, I'm passing on both. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't think it was very effective that the twist was given away too early, and then yeah. the twist on top of the twist with the brain transplant was just absurd. There was no way of predicting that, which is annoying. Um, it felt very generic. Otherwise. I don't know. There was nothing especially clever about it. It wasn't very... Uh, here's the thing. It was trying to be scary and funny. And I don't it, think it was trying to be funny. Oh, definitely. At I, times. A little bit, but not very much. But it wasn't very scary and it wasn't very funny. I think it wasn't terrifying in the sense of like jump scares or like in the sense of like a typical horror movie, but it was genuinely unnerving. It was like... Eh, it had me on edge. I've been much more creeped out. Yeah. Huh. I wasn't anticipating such a negative reaction. I'm going to go consider on both. Okay. Um, and I feel like for the writer's verdict, you know, yeah. I, I'm passing on the script for sure, but also I can put, I can take into consideration since I've seen Keanu, mm-hmm. that was another feature that, that he wrote that, uh, yeah, that just strengthens, strengthens my conviction about passing on the writer. Cause I didn't really okay. like Keanu that much either. Sure. I, I was kind of mixed on Keanu. I didn't think it was great, but what do we take into account his work on Key and Peele? Yeah. Because I think that's great. That's really... But I think yeah. a fe- features are a different thing, and we're judging Definitely. him in the sense of a feature writer. So yes. that's why I'm going to stay and consider. Okay. As a consider for both. Because I think this... Yeah, I would consider both for okay. this. Okay. Um, And I would recommend that people watch Key and Peele. 
Okay. Yeah. That's neither here nor Fair. There. Cool. All right. So, yeah, next week, the script requested by Andrew. I'm going to say Mena for now. Yeah. I don't know. But we'll hopefully know by next time. But anyway, it's written by Gary Spinelli. And it says, a pilot lands work for the CIA and as a drug runner in the South during the 1980s. 